The cloak dropped, revealing what looked like a huge razor shell contraption. With the inventors insisting this thing was going to fly, it would become the first powered airplane that for 12 seconds would fly 20 feet above the beach for a distance of 120 feet. Those 12 seconds would change the world of aviation for life. Unsure and a bit scared, witnesses watched as the razor shell thing moved forward. It wasn't very fast and it ricketed its way down the tracks and then it lifted up and up. Clumsy, it dipped, rose and bounced, but it did take flight. Flying for a whole 12 seconds. This is the story of the legendary Wright brothers and this is the good, the bad and the pure evil. The Wright brothers consisted of Orville and Wilbur Wright. They were American aviation pioneers. They would become known for inventing, building and flying the world's first successful motor operated airplane. They would go on to develop from their first achievement and would break through with their creations of three axis control system, which was huge as it meant the pilot could steer and maintain equilibrium. This was such a game changer and so well crafted that it remains standard on fixed winged aircraft today. Their aim from the get go was to develop a reliable method of pilot control. They strongly believed this was a huge flying problem that needed to be solved. When they went to patent, they didn't patent the invention of the flying machine, but patented into the system of the aerodynamic control that changed the flying machine's surface. Wilbur was the oldest, born in 1867, and Orville was born in 1871. Their parents were loving, their father was Milton and was a bishop in the liberal United Breton Church in Christ. And their mother Susan was quiet and shy with a creative spark even making custom toys for the children. The boys were two of five children but the two were very close. The boys were dreamers and loved to explore and discover. They looked at the glass half full not empty. Their interest in aviation came about when their father came home with a small 50 cent French helicopter toy. Although basic in its construction, it fascinated the boys. The boys would also be messing with something, exploring its functionality, ability, strength and its weaknesses. Teachers would particularly rem remember Orville, always at his desk tinkering away with something. When questioning what he was doing, Orville would say he was making a sort of machine that he and his brother would one day fly. The boys never attended college but would attend high school and in 1889 Orville would start a printing press which Wilbur soon joined. The boys would go on to open a bicycle shop in 1893 which was called the Wright Cycle Company in Dayton. Cycling was a huge at the time making a lot of money and soon the brothers were designing and making their own bicycles. They didn't just work together, they also lived together, and although they were close, they actually were chalk and cheese in personality. Wilbur was outgoing, energetic, serious, and liked an elephant never forgot. He would also be very self-critical. Orville, he was shy, quiet, but would be much happier in himself, and would be brilliant mechanically. The brothers were they were also known to be close, but they are also close to their care and sister Catherine, who would be often considered the rock and also known as the third Wright brother. Now in 1896, this would be a pivotal year for the family. Little Orville would be taken down with typhoid fever. Wilbur would be worried for Orville and didn't like seeing him sick. So Wilbur sat by Orville's bed day and night, caring for him and nursing him back to health. While Orville slept, Wilbur read up about aviation again, especially about the pioneer Otto Lilienthal, who tragically died during his experiments. This sparked his interest in flying again, and when Orville was strong enough to at least stay awake, Wilbur advised him to read up on it too. Orville got really into gliders and the theory of flight. The brothers took the interest further, studying the original flyers they weren't man-made, but nature's creations, birds. They studied them intensely because they believed birds held the secrets of flying. Orville would say that from birds, it was like learning the secret of magic from a magician. From there, the brothers contacted the Smithsonian Institute and the Weather Bureau 
for deeper knowledge and advice on flight theories and aeronautics. With the 20th century starting and with money in the bank from their bicycle shop, the brothers started building their own glider. When ready for testing, they went to a small community, Kitty Hawk, which had large sand dunes giving good lifts and dips and soft landings if needed. The locals found the boys oddly amusing but soon grew to love them and accept them. The boys would visit Kitty Hawk many, many times over the next few months to test their gliders and to study local birds. They would eventually build their own workshop up there too. So in 1903, after much testing and adjusting, the brothers were convinced they could build a flyer with an engine. They even used their own mechanic from the bike shop to build such an engine. They spent a year building a new, improved design. By the fall, they were back in Kitty Hawk, ready to make history with the first powered flight. Waiting for the right moment, the right time of day, the right conditions, they were set and took to the dunes with a handful of nervous locals. Mid-morning, Orville took the rope restraints off and headed forward. The speed wasn't fast. Wilbur held the left wing with no issues. A local man was cameraman, although not a professional one, he would capture a photo that would become part of history. Orville described the flight as extremely erratic, like a bucking bronco. When asked if he was scared, he smiled and said there was simply no time. The plane would fly 120 feet and would be airborne for 12 seconds. Days before the right flight, Samuel Langley, secretary of the Smithsonian Institute, built a $72,000 flying machine which had crashed in the Potomac River. This made news locally and nationally and completely overshadowed the brothers' success, ignoring their history making. So back to the Daytona went Orville and Wilbur. They were ecstatic from their achievement and continued tweaking and improving their flyer. They improved on themselves and became expert flyers, but the media still weren't sure. The brothers continued on regardless as their dreams were coming true and they actually were inventing a flying machine. So America wasn't interested in the brothers, but over the waters, France and Britain were very interested. So interested, they wanted to buy the Wrights flyer. The brothers flew to Europe along with their sister Catherine. In Europe, there were celebrities. They demoed the flyer, this time manned by Wilbur in 1908. The media called it a great white bird and were amazed that it actually flew. Returning in 1908, America finally took notice. The government contacted the brothers to order a contract to supply the U.S. Army its first military planes. They would resume testing at the old reliable Kitty Hawk, but the once peaceful beach was now buzzing with reporters. Going into 1909, the brothers were celebrated in their hometown, Dayton. They were even presented with medals for their achievement. The medals were presented by President William Howard Taft. Reporters would account that although the brothers appreciated recognition, they weren't ones to party and would be seen dipping in and out of the celebrations to go to the workshop to continue working. Wilbur being the more outgoing would become the face of the new Wright Company. But with fame comes money and with money comes jealousy. Soon the brothers would be in a patent wars. They would become more about making money and protecting paintings than exploring and expanding. The brothers would all work and would be life with long bachelors. Their work was their internal love. Like I said, Wilbur was the face, so he had to travel a lot. He would go to Berlin in 1911 for a training flight with a German pilot. It's not known exactly what happened, but Wilbur would never fly again after it. He would stay another six months in Europe dealing with business and legal issues. Wilbur loved the European life and its architecture, with space and green around important buildings, and he believed the US should adapt to the same approaches. Back in the US, he still traveled to New York, Washington, and Dayton. All of this on top of working would start to take its toll on Wilbur. Now in April 12, while in Boston, Wilbur would take ill. It's thought but not confirmed that he became sick after eating some bad shellfish. He went back to Dayton in May but was still very ill, breaking down both mentally and physically, eventually being diagnosed with typhoid fever. 
He kept fighting, but let, would let go and si- sadly died May 30th at the age of 45. The tragedy would continue. In 1912 to 1913, there would be multiple fatal crashes of the Wright's planes in the US Army, which called into question their safety and their design. By 1913, 11 people would have died in these crashes, half of which was the Model C of the Wright planes. What would happen is the plane would just nosedive. Orville alone tried to fight it and he tried his best to fix the situation by suggesting pilot error. He did cooperate with the army to try at least solve this by installing very basic flight indicators so the pilot could at least avoid climbing too steep. Eventually though the issue couldn't be fixed, the Model C would be classed dynamically unsuitable for flying so the military would end using them. With Wilbur's death, Orville stepped up to be president of the Wright Company. In 1914, the company won the famous Collier Trophy for the Model E. Orville didn't like the business end of things and would sell the company in 1915, becoming Wright Martin in 1916. He would build a beautiful house and moved into it along with his father and his sister. His father in his late 80s was very sprightly, reading and writing articles and enjoying walks. He died at age 88 in the spring of 1917. In 1918, Orville would pilot his last flight in the Wright Model B. He would retire and become an elder statesman of the aviation on such committees like the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics and also the Aeronautical Chamber of Commerce. In 1926, his sister Catherine would marry. Orville would be anything but happy about this. He was fuming and upset and he wouldn't attend the wedding and didn't speak to her again until her dying days in March 1929. Orville would stay on the National Advisory Committee for 28 years, and in 1930 would receive the first Daniel Guttenheim Medal, which was for promotion of aeronautics. In 1936, he became a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and in 1939, President Roosevelt would announce National Aviation Day on Orville's birthday. April 19, 1944, Howard Hughes would pilot a Lockheed Constellation. He flew from Burbank to Boston at ZC in under seven hours. When returning, they dropped by the right field. They let Orville have one last flight. It's believed he handled the controls of the Lockheed. Orville would die January 30th, 1948, age 76. He's buried with his brother and family in Dayton, Ohio. These guys, although hard for their time, they had the perfect mix of mechanical ability and intelligence. They were dreamers who became doers. Many dispute the claim they designed the first flyer and being the first to fly. It's irrelevant to be honest because their achievements were remarkable and a game changing in the aviation world. To end on a quote by Charles Keaterlin about the brothers, the Wright brothers flew right through the smokescreen of the impassibility. Thanks for listening. Next time I'll be talking about the terrible Santa Barbara oil spill of 1969. Until then, this is the good, the bad and the pure evil.